All right, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started uh, today. Good afternoon, uh, a special warm welcome to those folks who uh, have interviewed with us today for uh, Critical Care Fellowship and Pulmonary Critical Care Fellowship um, uh, who are now uh, joining by Zoom for our Grand Rounds presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jennifer Langstangle, who is one of our current fellows here in the uh, pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine for her Grand Rounds presentation today. Uh, after completing her residency and a chief residency at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics, um, Dr. Lang Sangel worked as a general internist and served as core internal medicine faculty for two years uh, in an underserved community in Lehigh Valley and um, has had a, a long-standing interest in issues surrounding social determinants of health. Uh, we were fortunate to recruit her to Yale for her fellowship training in 2021. And building on her interests in social determinants of health, Jennifer, Jennifer joined my research team uh, on a project funded um, by an NIH initiative known as the HEAL initiative, which is an acronym uh, standing for helping to end addiction long term. And this is an all hands on deck $2 billion uh, initiative uh, funded by the NIH. Um, to examine novel mechanisms, novel pathways, and, and potentially novel therapeutic targets uh, to get a hold on the opioid uh, epidemic. Uh, the parent study that she's engaged with is, is looking at leveraging sleep and circadian biology uh, to examine mechanisms between sleep deficiency and opioid use disorder. And her focus on her research has been on um, the construct of sleep control, uh, which is, um, as she'll talk about, a potentially very important novel social determinant of health. Uh, she has competed for and uh, was awarded the ATS Aspire Fellowship uh, Program, which provides uh, seed money for research funding. Uh, and is uh, this program specifically is designed to support and encourage pulmonary critical care fellows uh, doing sleep related uh, uh, research. Uh, and she has herself, uh, along with other uh, fellows in our program, um, applied for sleep medicine fellowship training next year, including in our own program. And we hope she joins us. Her talk today is entitled Sleep Deficiency and Opioid Use Disorder, Bidirectional Mechanisms and Novel Therapeutic Target. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll just move along. I have no disclosures, if only. Um, but yes, that's the CME code. I think it's also in the Zoom chat box for anyone who needs it. All right, so here's a little bit of a background and uh, like format for what we're gonna do today. We're gonna go through a quick background on opiate use disorder, just to sort of set the landscape for where we are as a country on this, do a little bit of sleep and circadian biology with the caveat, I am not a sleep physician yet. Um, then we're gonna do uh, talk a little bit about what sleep deficiency is and talk about it across the trajectory of opiate use disorder. And then we'll really dive into sort of the bi-directional mechanisms between sleep deficiency and OUD. Um, I'll introduce the concept of sleep control. And at the end, we'll talk a bit about some exciting therapeutic targets that are emerging in the research world. So for a little bit um, of background and context on opiate use disorder, um, I know a lot of us here work in the intensive care unit and we have seen the many faces of the opiate epidemic in this country. Um, what's really interesting is the number of overdose deaths has increased um, basically um, over 30% from 2019 to 2020 and it has continued um, skyrocketing. It's actually quintupled since 1999. Um, and since, um, in 2020, over three quarters of the overdose deaths were opiate related. Um, and so, you know, opiate death rates are rapidly rising. Um, prescription opiate involved deaths are still rising. Heroin is actually falling and synthetic opiate um, death rates are rising exponentially at this point. And if you look, there's sort of three waves of the opiate um, crisis in this country, which was declared a public health epidemic, um, I think in 2018. So back in the early 90s, that was sort of when we when heroin um, was the big opiate. Um, and so 
Um, then after that came the phase of the Sacklers, um, which sort of everyone is very familiar with at this point. Um, and that was the rise of like Oxycontin and prescription opiates. Um, then there was a second rise in heroin. Um, and after that was the introduction of um, super potent synthetic opiates, which is where we are right now um, with a very, just very concerning trajectory. Um, this is just to kind of contextualize things at a state level, because I think when we think of the epidemic, um, you want to know where we are as a country, because things do vary geographically across the country. Um, Connecticut is on the same escalating curve as the rest of the country. In 2012, there were 357 overdose deaths. And in 2021, there was over 1,500. And it's continued rising since then. Um, Cocaine-involved deaths are also rapidly rising because there's been um, contamination of the cocaine supply with fentanyl, where basically all cocaine at this point is considered contaminated with fentanyl. Um, you know, what is, how do we treat opiate use disorder? And this is something that I think when I was in, entered residency, wasn't something I was very comfortable or familiar with. Um, and I've sort of, you know, by working in this country in the 2010s and 2020s, you sort of have become exposed to more and more of it as opiates have become more and more of a problem. So medication for opiate use disorder is the standard of care. And it is considered best practice to prescribe this and use it as part of a comprehensive treatment plan. Um, in addition to psychosocial and behavioral therapy. So this is most commonly methadone and buprenorphine. There's a small role for naltrexone, but in general, um, when people talk about MOUD, they're talking about methadone and buprenorphine. Um, so you were, you're like, great, she's talking to me about methadone, but I'm at a sleep talk. So where do we go? Um, you know, sleep and opiate use disorder, it, they're actually intrinsically related to each other. And so there is effective evidence-based frontline treatment um, for opiate use disorder, MOUD. Relapse rates are high and actually the long-term um, abstinence rate with MOUD is, is about a third um, of long-term sobriety. So it's not very high. Um, and you know, so there's this issue of lack of retention and treatment and continued cycle of illicit opiate use. And so there really is a critical need to identify novel strategies and new approaches to complement and enhance MOUD, improve retention and treatment, and reduce recurrent use, because often it's those relapses that lead to overdose and death. And so one strategy is targeting the neurobiological system that can be linked to OUD relapse, and one of those targets is the sleep and circadian system. And so we know that sleep disturbance is common and often severe in persons with OUD, um, even those on treatment. Um, there's small studies, there's not great evidence, but some of them cite about two thirds of patients with OUD have some sort of significant sleep disturbance. Um, so in 2018, um, in a meeting that was designed to sort of talk about ways to work on this problem, OUD patients actually identified sleep disturbance as a primary contributor um, to why they are not able to maintain sobriety. So this is, <laughs> someone's like, oh, now we're, now we're going to art history. This is great. So this actually, it's really funny. Um, we were, I was talking about when I was, when I was, when Dr. Yagi was helping me make this, make these slides, you know, we sort of talked about this. Um, this over here is Morpheus and he's the God of dreams. And it's actually where the word morphine comes from. Um, which is sort of um, interesting. And Morpheus is the son of Hypnos, who is here flying with Nyx, who's the goddess of night. And he's actually, Hypnos is spreading poppies to help people sleep. So if you look back historically, even back to ancient Greek times, there's this interplay of sleep and opiates, right? But um, as a clinical domain, it's actually, as an investigator, it's a very young field um, that's really just starting to um, emerge. So now we're going to start to talk a little bit about some basic concepts of sleep and circadian biology, just to give us like a little groundwork for where we're going. Um, so sleep, um, you know, sleep is a really, it's really important. We well, all know that though, um, but it's so important that science and nature have actually dedicated issues to this in recent years. And we know that um, sleep impacts a lot of physiological processes and organ systems throughout the body. And that includes hormone secretion, metabolic regulation, immune function, 
cardiovascular function, which has been a really active domain of research recently, energy conservation, memory and cognitive function, mood, brain plasticity, and then glymphatics, which is clearing of neurotoxic waste, um, is a really new, is an, another emerging field. And if you look, um, so this is actually an N3 sleep, and this is cerebrospinal fluid um, filtering through and processing. Um, so, um, this is called a hypnogram. And so one thing I like to point out is the physiology of sleep is different from wakefulness. So sleep is not just turning off wakefulness. They're actually different systems that work in a balance with each other. And so, um, a hypnogram is essentially a visual representation, a graphical representation of what goes on in sleep. Um, sleep is split into REM the R spikes and non-REM over here. And basically um, we can tell them apart by EEG. Early in the night, you have more N3 sleep. And as you're approaching morning, you have breakthrough REM spikes, um, more REM. And so um, this is just sort of the basic of what sleep um, looks like in a normal person. Um, so, when we think about sleep, we think about um, obstructive sleep apnea, and there's this concept called P-crit or critical closing pressure, um, which is a uniquely human phenomenon. And it's a balance of forces in the upper airway. Um, so on the side of forces that promote airway patency, you have pharyngeal dilator muscle contraction. And then on promotion forces that promote airway collapse, we have the negative pressure of inspiration as well as extra luminal positive pressure. So things like fat deposition in the neck, small mandible. Um, and what you have is this anatomical predisposition um, towards or away um, upper airway stability. And so people with highly collapsible upper airways may have a pre-crit um, that is like very, very small. And so their airways are very easy to collapse as opposed to people with extremely stable upper airways will have a very, very negative pre-crit and their airway will be harder to collapse. And so um, this is important because when we look at, you have to look at why someone has obstructive sleep apnea. And so we have people who have stable upper airways and we know they're not going to have obstructive apnea. And we have people who have super collapsible airways who will, but then there's people in the vulnerable position. And what you're saying is, do they have non-anatomical traits that are potentially contributing to them developing OSA, such as high loop gain, um, poor muscle responsiveness or low arousal thresholds, um, which could contribute to this. Because um, people don't all get OSA for the same reason. So even if they're sitting in front of you with that phenotype, the reason that they have it could be very different. Um, and so now we're gonna transition a little bit into sleep deficiency and the trajectory of opiate use disorder. So. To pull it back to what is sleep deficiency? Um, in, in contrast to sleep disorder breathing, um, sleep deficiency is actually a much broader concept. And so um, sleep deprivation is not getting enough sleep. So that would be like short sleep duration. There's also things like non-circadian sleep, which is people sleeping at the wrong time of day. So people are out of sync with their body's natural clock, um, abnormalities in sleep timing, regularity, um, things like that. And then poor sleep quality. You don't sleep well or get all of the different types of sleep um, for, for some reason. And so they have impaired sleep architecture or a different sleep disorder that's causing poor quality sleep. And all of those make you sleep deficient. Um, and so sleep deficiency is a really important concept because it actually accompanies opiate use disorder in different ways across the trajectory of addiction. So when people first start using um, in this, in the kind of the cycle of misuse phase, you have the social jet lag, which is when people have different sleep wake clocks um, during non work day, and you have um, delayed sleep phase. So it's circadian rhythm abnormalities um, in this stage. And that's been linked to addiction vulnerability, actually. 
um, in withdrawal. Um, patients are, we know, have increased sleep latency, so it takes them longer to fall asleep, and they have decreased total sleep time and, total, and sleep quality um, in addition to their physiologic symptoms that they're experiencing. Um, in recovery, 90% of patients in MOUD recovery programs um, have poor quality sleep, and this is actually from Dr. Baldessari's work. And then um, eventually, um, you end up at the final stage, which is death. And opioid-related deaths can occur during sleep because sleep decreases your respiratory drive. Opiates decrease your respiratory drive. They decrease your control of breathing, which predisposes to respiratory failure and death. So um, the bidirectional mechanisms between sleep deficiency and opiate use disorder are something that is very important to to dive into and, and to understand. Um, and so when you look at um, the summary of sort of what is the effect of opiates on key, key sleep parameters, right? Because I just said opiates are bad for sleep, but what does that actually mean? Um, we know that in the acute phase, um, they increase sleep disturbance, they increase your sleep onset latency, they increase your REM latency, um, and they decrease your sort of slow wave sleep um, and they make you have more N1, N2 sleep and less N3 sleep. Um, and they also increase your arousal index and they make you feel sleepier the next day. Um, so they're inherently very bad for sleep architecture in the acute setting. Um, the chronic setting is more mixed. It's a much more complex picture, um, but there's definitely uh, signs that they do cause sleep disturbance. Um, in addition to impairing sleep at the architectural level, we know that opiates have direct inhibitory effects on the three major components of the ventilatory control system. Um, so at the uh, cerebral level, you have the controller, which is the cortex, the pons, the medulla. You have sensors, which are your like carotid aortic bodies and lung receptors. And then you have your effectors, which is your diaphragm and your accessory muscles of respiration. Um, and so the functions of these components decrease with sleep, and then they're all, they're each also further impaired with the addition of opiates, um, leading to several different forms of sleep disordered breathing. So this is something called biots respiration, um, which is a, kind of a classic opioid breathing um, pattern. Um, and it's an erratic or ataxic breathing pattern characterized by bradypnea, which is very slow breathing, and then frequent pauses. Um, and they have variation in the depth of the respirations that they take. Um, and so um, we, we know that um, people with opiates are kind of prone to this erratic, irregular breathing pattern. I think it's nice because I just showed you sort of a polysomnogram to talk about what do we see. So this is a polysomnogram. These are EEG leads. This is airflow. And then down here is measurement of respiratory effort. So if you look here, these are all flat, which says they're not trying to breathe and there's no airflow. So this is a central apnea where the person um, has no airflow, but they're also not trying to breathe. So it's coming from above. To distinguish this from an obstructive apnea, where again, there's no flow, but there's, re there's respiratory muscle effort. And so this is an obstructive apnea. Um, and there is an overlap in the pathophysiology between central and obstructive um, sleep apnea. But we also know that um, opiates impact um, people's um, predisposition um, to both forms of apnea. So people with opioids can develop multiple forms of um, sleep disordered breathing. And so that can make them much more complex to treat. It's also important to realize that the apnea hypopnea index or the AHI is actually dose dependent on their opiate dosing, which I think is just, um, it's, so it's not just, I gave them enough opiate and now I flip them over into sleep disorder breathing and that's the way they're going to breathe. It is actually truly 
um, dose dependent, um, which is kind of nice to see. And so MOUD compared to age and BMI match control. And if you can look, MEQ is morphine equivalence. Um, so it's a sort of standardized way to represent dosing of narcotics. And if you look, um, per ratios increase of morphine equivalent doses. And it didn't just increase one type of apnea, it actually increased both central and obstructive apneas, uh, showing really, as we know, that the whole ventilatory regulatory system is being impacted. Um, in addition to opiates contributing to sleep deficiency, we know that there are mechanisms um, where sleep deficiency leads to increased opioid use, sort of reversing the mechanism or it's a pointing out that it is a bi-directional uh, mechanism. And so um, where you have is, so people start off sleep deficient um, and we know that, and that leads to neurocognitive mechanisms like impaired executive function, um, increased salience, negative emotionality, um, and then they also have neuropsychiatric mechanisms because sleep deficiency increases chronic stress, it worsens pain, um, it lowers mood. And both of those um, can lead to opioid use, worsening addiction severity, worsening symptoms, and decreasing social function. Um, so treating sleep in this patient population isn't just treating a byproduct, it's actually treating something that is truly um, changing the, their trajectory properly potentially. Um, and there are overlapping neural pathways in sleep deficiency and addiction. So we know that repeated drug exposure can affect circuits in the prefrontal cortex, the extended amygdala and the basal ganglia. So executive function rewards um, perception and salience. And we know that sleep deficiency actually impacts similar systems, overlies the same system. So um, we're actually have been able to see that these same systems are being used in both. Um, so we're using the same neural pathways. Um, and so the pain opioid sleep deficiency cycle, I think is something that as a physician and working with patients, you sort of realize that patients end up in what feels like these loops where they're asking for more and more medicine and they're saying they can't sleep. Can I take more so that I can just go to sleep? Um, and this is actually something that's been well documented and is being studied. So patients have increased pain. That leads to increased opioid dosing. Um, that actually leads to impaired sleep. That impaired sleep then causes them to increase their pain perception. And so you end up in this very vicious cycle of increasing um, opiate doses um, with increased and uncontrolled pain in these patients. Um, so where does that put us? So HEAL. HEAL is helping end addiction long-term. It's an NIH initiative. It's actually the biggest NIH um, initiative I think that they've ever had. It is uh, across all the agencies and it's $2 billion. Um, and the goal was to look at uh, novel approaches to addiction and treatment and pain management um, to really, it was an all hands on deck situation. National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute received about $26 million, um, a portion of which was to be focused on the studying of sleep and circadian biology. So that brings us to CLOUDS. CLOUDS is Yale's HEAL-funded study. It is a uh, co, um, Dr. Yagi is one of the PIs. Um, there are also PIs in addiction, psychiatry, and radiology and school of nursing. Um, and it stands for Collaboration Linking Opioid Use Disorder and Sleep. And it, we, it is a very large study that has um, three sort of aims. Aim one is looking at a neurocognitive connectivity pattern um, in patients with adequate versus deficient sleep and brain systems um, involved in addiction and assessing for a neural fingerprint to sort of predict ongoing opioid use. Um, aim two is looking at biologic, psychiatric, and pharmacologic mechanisms 
to explain the causal pathway between sleep deficiency and opioid use by looking at me known OUD risk factors as mediators. Um, and AIM-3 is social and ecologic factors, such as like a social family and neighborhood contextual factors associated with OUD contributing to sleep deficiency. Um, CLOUDS is uh, an observational study uh, with a target of 220 enrollment. Um, patients present, uh, enroll in the study sort of either when they're screening in to begin MOUD or shortly after initiating MOUD um, at the APT Foundation, which has three sites around New Haven, which were, were, are utilized for this study. Um, they basically begin, um, they begin either methadone or puke. Um, they then go through a really rigorous set of baseline assessments, including sleep and circadian assessments, fMRI, neuropsychiatric assessments, and home environment and psychosocial monitoring. The patients come back for weekly follow-up for six months, which is part of their standard treatment at the APT Foundation, um, and they do, um, they do urine, drug screens, and self-reports, and the outcome is basically percent of days with illicit opioid use um, for those six months of follow-up. Um, I am working under AIM-3, and so I'm evaluating the psychosocial, environmental, and ecologic factors that predict control over sleep, um, examining the association between control over sleep and subjective and objective measures of sleep, and determining the degree to which control over sleep is predictive of recurrent opioid use. So sleep control. Um, so sleep control is sort of um, the ability of a person to control um, when they sleep and how well they sleep. But the br brief index of sleep control is actually the only measure of sleep control uh, that exists right now. It's a four item Likert study uh, scale, and it's designed to see, assess self-perceived control over sleep. And it's, it's assessing variables sort of that um, a person is likely to have control over. So it asks about, can you control when you go to sleep, when you wake up, um, and sort of four items like that. Um, it is validated in a diverse population, and it's scored from zero to four with a higher score representing increased sleep control and a lower score representing decreased sleep control. And a one point increase is, is associated with better sleep quality, decreased daytime sleepiness and decreased insomnia, even when adjusted for work hours. So it is, um, it is definitely um, appears to be valid in measuring something. Um, on the environmental, ecological and social measures, we're measuring a tremendous amount of data including neighborhood violence scores, social cohesion scores, walkability, availability of healthy foods. And that's sort of playing into the social level factors. When you think about what's impacting sleep, you think about societal level factors. So like remember back in when the pandemic first started, the level of like social unease and social stress, sort of that's something you would consider like a societal level factor. Um, at the social level factor, so things like you know, is my neighborhood less safe so I don't sleep as well because I am afraid of violence in my neighborhood, things like that would sort of fit in there. Um, what is someone's social networks? Um, do they have support within their neighborhood? Things like that, we're measuring all of that. And then individual level factors. So genetics, beliefs, um, attitudes, um, behaviors that they engage in, you know, psychology, health and other choices. Um, so for that, we also are taking um, childhood trauma questionnaires because we know that history of um, trauma can be significant. Um, and then we're also measuring um, pain, um, both current chronic pain, history of chronic pain, um, and pain catastrophizing skills. Um, for our objective measures of sleep, um, we are doing an in-lab um, polysomnograph they're also wearing actographs for two weeks that can also measure uh, sleep-wake cycles and light exposure, and they are keeping sleep journals. Um, on the subjective side of sleep measurements, we're doing the upward sleepiness scale, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, the Insomnia Severity Index, the Promise Sleep Disturbance Questionnaire, and then the BRESC. So I have some 
very preliminary data. We've just reached our target enrollment of 220 patients and are currently completing the six month follow up on all of our recruited um, patients. Um, we have a less than 10% uh, loss to follow up rate. So we actually have a really high retention rate um, because the patients are coming in to, for weekly treatment. So if they're staying active on their on their MOUD, um, we're able to follow them because the um, study team members are, are literally sitting in the APT Foundation. Um, so for baseline demographics, I think what's nice to point out is we had a 42% female sample size and 22% non-white. Uh, non it historically has been difficult to um, find enough non-white members to participate in studies on MOUD. Um, um, and then 63% um, had high school education or less. And if you look, a third are, are full-time employed, and then um, another about 20% are working um, just sort of part-time or irregular hours. Um, so here is our baseline sleep control scores. And what's interesting is you can see the mean here is 1.63. This is low <laughs> um, with a standard deviation of one. Um, so this is quite low and the median is also 1.5. Um, and if you look at the histogram, um, you can see that sort of it's shifted to the left showing that um, which is over here, this is the low control side of things. So saying, um, that the patients with opiate use disorder have pretty low sleep control. Um, the SHADE study is what was used to validate the BRISC, and that was a, a large, like, very mixed um, multi-ethnic population outside of Philadelphia. So here is our baseline sleep, subjective sleep data. Um, about two-thirds of patients in the study had evidence of insomnia, and about 60% had poor sleep quality, which is pretty consistent with what's reported in the literature. Um, and about 25% had evidence of excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, so definitely an abnormal sleep population to begin with. Um, here is um, our brisk data versus sort of our demographics. We were just curious to see um, were there any trends in our demographic variables for people who are prone to poor sleep control? Um, those with a low level, lower level of education, specifically high school or less, um, were statistically significantly more likely to have poor sleep control, um, which is interesting because that was 63% of our study population as well. Um, also, people who were living alone, um, were, that was associated with poor sleep control. And there is a trend towards some sex differences, but it's not statistically significant. Interestingly, employment um, was not significant, um, whether, they whether they owned their home or were in a different housing situation, including homelessness, was not significant. Um, the correlation of risk and some of our subjective sleep outcomes. Um, as you might expect, um, so, you know, there, the higher, um, that sleep control is sort of correlated with subjective measures of sleep. Um, so the higher, I, the higher patients with higher ISI are correlated with having lower, lower sleep control, which makes sense because a higher ISI is higher insomnia, lower sleep control. And that, that held that trend also um, withstood with sleep quality. Again, um, poorer sleep quality, lower sleep control. Interestingly, F worth and sleepiness not correlated. Um, and then also hours of actual sleep was correlated. Um, so less sleep, lower sleep control. Um, this is probably, so this is just a very preliminary um, of our primary endpoint. Um, this is our recurrent illicit opioid use, um, but this is, these patients are in active follow-up. So it was just a marker dropped in sort of a moment in time. Um, 
one third of patients were not using illicit opiates at follow-up, um, which remember I told you earlier, that's about on par with what we would expect based on published norms in MOUD. Two thirds had significant recurrence. Um, so we have one third here, they're not using. Um, then we have another third who are about over here and they're using about 10 to 50% of days in follow-up. And then the last third is over here using 50 to 100% of days. This is illicit opiate on top of um, their MOUD. Um, and thus far in our follow-up, um, patients who are actively in current follow-up, they have a mean of 27 days um, of illicit opioid use. So that means in the six months, wherever they are in their follow-up, on average, they've used 27 days. So now I made everyone feel like, so we're doing all this and we're getting nowhere. Well, there's hope on the horizon. Um, so there's some really interesting novel therapeutic targets that are coming up. Um, so the first is CBTI, um, which is everyone uh, is aware of is cognitive and behavioral therapy for insomnia. It is the first line therapy for insomnia. Um, and there's also CBT for chronic pain and substance use disorder. And the hope is that you could potentially overlap them um, and improve outcomes. And there's really a low risk of harm with CBTI. Um, there's a very few studies evaluating CBTI and OUD, um, but CBTI significantly reduced sleep disturbance. So that's that Pittsburgh sleep quality um, index compared to a placebo group. Um, Overall, CBTI has shown promise for opiate use disorder and other substance use disorders, but more studies are needed. And then the big challenge is access to CBTI and adherence. However, um, in recent years, there's been a rise of, of apps for CBTI, and so potentially utilizing them as part of a wraparound care in, in MOUD treatment is one idea that that could potentially have benefits. And also since the pandemic, especially, there's been a rise in telehealth, um, which, had, which is um, hopefully one way to improve access um, to CBTI. Um, pharmacotherapy for insomnia and OUD. There are very few studies um, that exist on this. Um, and so it's an area where you want to avoid medic medications with addiction potential because you don't want to um, you know, sort of replace someone's opiate with a different addictive substance. Um, and so most studies that are done with pharmacotherapy are working with medications with low addiction potential. Um, so um, trazodone has been studied without any improvement in MOUD. Um, mirtazapine, also known as Remeron versus Zolpidem, which is Ambien. Um, mirtazapine improved total sleep time um, onset latency and sleep efficiency when compared to zolpidem or mirtazapine plus zolpidem um, and a placebo group in MOUD. Um, melatonin may improve sleep quality and depression. Um, quetiapine, which is Seroquel, um, may reduce insomnia, cravings, anxiety, and somatic pain during opioid detox. And suvorexant, which is Belsomra, um, improved total sleep time and REM time, reduced opioid withdrawal <laughs> severity and craving um, during buprenorphine tapers. So the orexin um, system. This is um, an area of really active research and a lot of hope in both sleep and addiction medicine right now. So orexin is producing neurons are located in the lateral hypothalamus and it inputs from the sleep and circadian system. Decreasing your orexin causes narcolepsy. Um, so basically sleep starts intruding into wakefulness. Um, increased orexin causes arousal, also sleep disturbance, which makes sense. Um, it increases stress signaling and actually in animal models can cause drug seeking. Um, orexin neurons also project to the reward areas of the brain. Um, so it certainly is an interesting target. And so there was preclinical evidence that blocking these neurons attenuates withdrawal and drug seeking behavior. So in 2018, NIDA listed um, 
dual orexin receptor antagonist or DORAs as part of its 10 most wanted medications um, development priorities in response to the opioid crisis. Um, and so um, there's multiple large scale randomized clinical trials actually going on studying the role of um, DORAs in opiate use disorder as well as insomnia in, and sleep disturbance in these patients. It's a very active, exciting area. Um, Opiate-induced sleep disordered breathing. Um, so adaptive cerebroventilation, um, which I think is, you know, is something I haven't had as much familiarity with, but basically the goal is to treat both the obstructive and central apnea. So you have a CPAP level breath continuously um, to treat the obstruction, but when the patient enters into this period of central apnea, you get a um, pressure supported breath at a backup rate and it targets a ventilation about 90% of their target ventilation. And so um, early studies suggest this is effective in treating opioid induced central sleep apnea. Um, there's a need for longer term studies to examine adherence and impact on other OUD outcome measures. Um, but this is one potential area of research as well. And then last is intranasal leptin. And so um, intranasal leptin can augment the hypercapnic and the hypoxic chemosensitivity and actually prevent opiate-induced um, sleep disorder breathing and improve survival after overdose in mouses and models. So over here, we have Kathleen Meyer curves um, the blue line are mice that got intranasal leptin, and the red is those that got placebo. And you can see there's a real, um, there's a significant p-value and a separation in the curves. So um, it works on, so one of those three ventilatory control levels, it works at the sensor level. So sort of your carotid bodies, your aortic bodies um, at those levels. And um, it's not yet been translated into humans, um, but it, it could be potentially beneficial for opiate-induced sleep disorder breathing, um, potentially patients who are in really a hypoventilatory crisis uh, could be beneficial. So to pull us all back, because that was a lot, opioids have negative effects on our sleep architecture um, in a lot of different ways. They make you more... They increase wakefulness during sleep, decrease total sleep time, decrease your sleep efficiency, they decrease your slow wave sleep, and they decrease your REM. Um, sleep deficiency is common and often severe in patients with OUD, and it's a bi-directional um, mechanism with increased opiate use leading to increased sleep deficiency, as well as sleep deficiency leading to increased opioid use. Um, Sleep control is one uh, potential ecologic factor, including a whole gamut of psychosocial, family, neighborhood, and contextual factors associated with OUD that may contribute to sleep deficiency. Um, and there are novel therapeutic targets for sleep disturbance in OUD, especially the DORAs, the orexin antagonists, as a major clinical focus. Um, I would like to thank everyone on the cloud study uh, for all of their help, especially Sangjun, um, our statistician who is beyond helpful and fantastic, as well as our grant, and then Dr. Kaminsky, the T32, Dr. Clark, and Dr. D'Ambrosio, and of course my co-fellows. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, questions? Yes. Let me just, I'll play. Price is right, host, and bring the mic. Ian. Jen, that was great. It's really fun to just think about different ways that you're trying to improve sleep. Um, I, I think it's, it's interesting. It reminds you of uh, educational literature and growth mindset and fixed mindset, like um, the BRISC score. I, I, I was thinking uh, if you have any specific thoughts or if uh, anyone has looked at the differential sleep architecture that may happen when you're coming off of opioids and in that withdrawal phase and trying to counsel patients that they're going to have definitely sleep disturbances that at that time, but that hopefully long-term as they come off 
their sleep will improve. And so I, I imagine it's a, a challenging thing to, to counsel patients on, but wondering if you had specific thoughts. So that's a great question. And you're right, there's a paucity of literature because it is admittedly hard to get patients who are going through opioid withdrawal to go into a sleep lab. Um, but what's funny is actually, because I went in and I was like, oh, but then when they get through withdrawal, their sleep's going to be fine. But it actually stays really abnormal the entire time, even if they're years into recovery. Um, but if they stay on MOUD, which a lot of our patients do need, um, they will have persistent, significant sleep um, changes, even with that. Um, and some, a lot of this work was done studying oncology patients who have to be on chronic opiates. Um, that's where that's where a chunk of this literature is from. But it is there is there is um, investigation into it, and certainly I think sleep in OUD has become a major target in recent areas because it's been recognized as not just a byproduct of the disorder, but potentially a key part of the disorder. Thanks, Jen. That was awesome. Um, I was curious if you guys are looking into or if you have any thoughts about um, like noise pollution and light pollution in neighborhoods, perhaps that are especially vulnerable to opioid use disorder and um, kind of how you'd fit that in with the other variables that you're looking into? Yes, that data is coming. Uh, no, we have a tremendous amount. And uh, Melissa Gnauer is on the study and she's also she's she's doing a tremendous amount with light exposure and she's also studying uh, salivary melatonin in them. Um, but yes, we are, that is in our neighborhood level data. Um, I, this is an amazing study, but the volume of data is, is extremely high um, that was, so we're sort of still going through it, but yes, uh, neighborhood light scores and they are wearing light exposure monitors for us. So Jen, that was really good. Um, so I, I'm just thinking there must be so much variability in the patients in terms of which narcotics they're using, how long they've been on it, the doses, potentially metabolism. So, uh, are you accounting for that or is there some way to account for that? We, we do collect um, how, many, how much they've been using recently as part of our enrollment. So yes, we, 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 are, we, are, um, we are attempting to account for that. That is also um, being collected. I know, I, I know we're collecting, and he probably knows better than me, but we're definitely collecting um, baseline addiction information. We also have uh, measurements of addiction severity um, and the brief addiction monitor that we're collecting on them as well um, to kind of characterize how severe their addiction is as, as well. And then a related question, is, is opiate use disorder going to affect sleep differently than opioid use? Because there are people who are not gonna be diagnosed with a disorder because they have a need for it. So actually that's why I'd referenced, um, there's been studies on cancer related pain because when you think of chronic opiate use, um, cancer related pain is a big one. And actually no, some of the studies have, have been done in, in those patients and they also often have significant sleep disturbance. They often don't have the associated uh, psychosocial complexity that OUD patients perhaps have, but they can be predisposed. So. Um, it is something to consider in chronic opioid patients if they're complaining of sleep disturbance. The answer may be to increase their opioids, but it also could be, are they having sleep disturbance and sleep architectural problems actually from their necessary pain medicine? Hi. Um, once again, thank you for a great uh, presentation. Um, this is a bit of an insignificant question, but just for the sake of my curiosity, uh, like earlier on um, in the presentation, how like what are kind of like the parameters for defining like treatment, like being considered treated for like an opioid addiction? Because in that same slide, it also mentions that relapse rates are like extraordinarily high for these. So it's like, I wanted to get an idea of what's like, what's the time span, I guess, um, when looking at patients that go through treatment and then are successfully considered to have been treated and then um, are recognized as having relapsed over like X so, amount of time. No, that's actually a good question. And there is variability. I'm not sure. So we're, and that's why we're actually explicitly doing percent of days with illicit opioid use as our primary outcome, because that can be variable um, depending on different studies. Um, 
because, but we also know that like in our study, patients um, will begin MOUD and the super potent, like the synthetic opioids are so um, addictive that patients sort of just continue using them. Um, I would have to get back to you because it's from SAMHSA, which is the and I, the national branch that sort of oversees all uh, MOUD programs that runs those statistics. And I can look at what they define the official cutoff. And I apologize, I just can't remember it right now. Yeah, I think that the, the parent study is enrolling patients who have just been recently stabilized on medication. So they have sought treatment. One of the great things about the App Foundation is that it's an open clinic model. And so pay, and you don't have to schedule appointments. You walk in when you need to be dosed, uh, et cetera. But within six weeks of being stabilized on medication for opioid use disorder. Thanks, Jen. You always make your co fellows look bad even though you thank us in that slide. Um, so um, my question's a little bit like, it's a little strange. I I saw that, uh, I mean, I read somewhere that people who use intravenous like fentanyl like to do it sitting up because if you fall asleep, then you might not experience the high or euphoria. Um, and I was wondering if you had any... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you know somebody, no, no. And I heard, and I, I saw it was in the news because in Philadelphia there was someone like sitting over slumped because you, if you start sitting up then you'll you'll slump over if you have too much. Um, so I don't know if you had any data on like where people sleep when they're if they're using that amount of op opioids and um, you know obviously that really affects their sleep sleep quality depending we, on where they're sleeping. We don't collect their position of sleep. Um, we do collect with actigraphy if they have periods, which you can see on some, some of the actigraphs, apparently you can see when people use, because then they'll have prolonged periods of just no action, no activity. Um, but no, we don't collect positional, um, data. I mean, I, I think like sitting up sort of makes sense, right? Cause we all think of like patients with other obstructive sleep disorders who sleep more propped upright just because of the physiology of it. But I don't know, I've not seen anything about positional sleeping, changing outcomes or changing the highs in opiate patients. Thanks. Any other questions? Were there questions in the chat? Okay. Okay. Do you just want to read out the question? I can. And Dr. Mathe said, how do you quantify family social factors in OUD patients relative to other potential risk factors? Um, and so we actually have a huge volume of questionnaires that are validated that we're using to assess um, both family dynamics. We have family function scales. We also have measures of and internal support within family, external support within the family. Um, and then of course, like questionnaires about abuse, neglect, um, things like that. Um, and then the brief addiction monitor, the BAM actually also discusses um, support both within family, within the household and within social network and from family outside your household. Um, so that's sort of how we're able to look into some of those factors and to try and dive into it. I left it sort of surface level because it is a, it is a tremendous volume of, of data that we are going through, but that it's actually been really interesting. We've just started parsing through that data. <laughs> that was really great, Jen, thank you. Um, I have a question, which it's sort of my music and I don't know if it has an answer, but this BRISC score is really fascinating. Um, can we target that? Can we change that? Or is that like an unmodifiable thing? We don't know. So the BRISC <laughs> score was developed by Dr. Michael Gradner, who's actually a sleep psychologist and researcher. Um, he's now at the University of Arizona. He was at UPenn um, as part of their sleep center before that. And it was originally, so this is the first time it's ever been used in a, in an addict, in a substance use disorder um, population. Um, so he, 
Um, so, so none of us know. Um, we just thought, um, let's run it and sort of see, because it's not burdensome to patients. It's literally four questions and they just sort of check boxes. And we were curious to see, is this something unique or is this something we're already targeting with all of these other questionnaires that we're giving? So the answer is to be determined, but potentially, potentially yes. I think that's an excellent question. And just one final comment, um, so we are using Michael's instrument and in this. He's done a lot of interesting work in the domain uh, and, and, and has put forth in the sleep field this hypothesis called the mind after midnight hypothesis. And he's very elegantly shown that suicide rates jump dramatically from the hours of 2 to 4 a.m. in the morning. And what we're, one of the data points that we're collecting in this study is when are patients overdosing? When are they are using? Uh, we all know we're not at our most rational thinking, from, except for Dr. Kaminsky, uh, from 2 to 4 o'clock uh, in, in the morning. But... Uh, <laughs> Um, so that's an interesting hypothesis. It has implications for a lot of um, outcomes that where you lose frontal control and increase impulsivity and, and things of that nature. So something further to explore. Thank you, Jen, very much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.